But my name is Joe Payne. I am the president and CEO of Code42. And as Krista said at the beginning, I also get pretty jazzed about uh, the problem around insider risk. I've been working on it for the last seven years or so. And you know, when we you first saw this presentation title, you may have seen it uh, written as insider threat versus insider risk. Um, I'm gonna. It's really gonna be broken into two parts. The first is talk a little about the problem itself and why it's growing so rapidly. And then the second part of this, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the solution um, that we've created at Code42, just a little bit, just to give you a glimpse of what's possible out there. Because I, I think there's a lot of people who just aren't aware. Why don't we start with the, the difference between insider risk and insider threat? I know most of you know this, but just, just to be clear about how we talk about it in today's context, um, you know, insider risk is a big, broad problem. It happens when people share information using their personal Gmail, uh, they save something to their Dropbox account, uh, maybe they put some files on a thumb drive, um, or they publicly share something uh, on their OneDrive account. And none of these things by themselves are necessarily a threat, and they're actually being done by our own employees. And so we don't tend to think of them as a threat. What we tend to think of them is people putting data at risk. Um, but clearly, there is a subset of this, which is uh, really around people that are doing it intentionally. And uh, Stephen talked about that a little bit at the beginning. I'm sorry, James actually was talking about at the beginning, uh, the type of uh, the difference between benign and malicious. So I won't spend too much time on that. Um, a lot of you are probably wondering, like, hey, does it even really matter? Like, you know, this is one of the things we run into a lot when we talk to security teams who are trying to balance all the different activities and work that they have is like, do I need to be worried about my 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 own employees and contractors? And um, I just like to tell this story real quick. You know, the folks at Appian had a contractor that worked for them that then got hired by their competitor, Pegasystems. And um, that particular contractor ended up sharing lots and lots of information about Appian this summer, a jury awarded Appian $2 billion in uh, damages, and they weren't punitive damages, they were actual damages. Now, to give you perspective, neither Appian or Pegasystems themselves is even worth $2 billion. So this is an enormous size uh, judgment against a company around insider risk. When this became personal and real to me, whether this was a board uh, level issue or not, was when we had a longtime employee, they'd been working for us for over 10 years, left the company. That employee uh, took their entire hard drive and, uh, and put it on an external drive. Now, being in the business that we're in, we caught that. And um, it, what came out was that on that hard drive of that long-term HR employee, not high level, pretty low level, but that person had all of our payroll data and the social security number for every single person in the company, including all of our board members. And that's when I was like, ah, this is going to be a real big problem. That was about five years ago. And we've been really focused hard on it ever since. In fact, the problem that we solve at Code 42 is protecting data from exposure, leak, or theft caused by employees and contractors, whether it's malicious or accidental. That's why we talk about insider risk. Now, let me just say the first part of this is about why you need to care and why this problem is exploding. Because if you think about it, insider risk has been around for, I don't know, as long as people have been around. And so why is this an issue you need to take on today? Well, there are three big drivers of insider risk and all of them are increasing. And I'd like to walk you through each one with a little bit of data to support it. So first of all, um, the, the, the biggest driver is this, this digital transformation that we're seeing in the economy today, um, tagged on with the advent of collaboration tools. So if we look at it, 90% of companies today are pursuing a digital strategy. And that means we're digitizing all of our data, all of our processes. If you were going to steal information from your company 15 years ago, you'd have to come in at night open up the file cabinet, put things on the Xerox machine and sort of sleek out under the cover of darkness. Nobody does that anymore. That is not how insider risk happens. And in fact, it's just, uh, or insider threat happens. It's, it's as easy as dragging a file across your desktop while sitting at Starbucks to make someone exfiltrate data or for someone to be able to exfiltrate data. So this problem um, has been made a lot easier by the digitization of data. But at the same time we digitize data, We've also focused on employee productivity and efficiency, which have been great. 
And CIOs have put in all of these new tools to allow us to share and collaborate and work together. And we love these tools. All of us love using Slack or Teams or OneDrive. We love having our data in Salesforce where it's easily accessible or in GitHub to put our source code in. And that's been fantastic. Unfortunately, um, all of those, almost all of these uh, products have personal versions that are easy to move data from the corporate version to the personal version. The other thing that's happened is that all of these uh, collaboration tools mean that we have data spread out all over the place, whether they're in cloud repositories like Salesforce or whether we're just sharing them via Slack or we're sharing them to an external channel on Slack. So fantastic tools, but also have really changed the playing field on data exfiltration. So let me just give you a couple examples. These are all real world examples. You know. Um, and Dr. Dudson said this morning, like, hey, I don't like to use examples. I want empirical evidence. And that's fantastic. That's his job. I'm glad he's doing that. The reason I use a lot of examples is because I think people aren't sure how whether their the problem affects them or not, and whether that, you know, the size of the problem. So I like to tell stories because I think those stories really bring the the uh, the, the challenge to light that many of us face. So this um, a few months back, uh, a bank that was actually trialing Code 42 software found an employee who was moving a data uh, into their personal GitHub account using Git commands. And the company came back to us and said, wow, we had no visibility into this. We were just trying our software. They weren't paying for it or anything. And they told us that that, that source code would be valued at about $5 million. So that's a pretty substantial problem that they weren't paying attention to and they weren't even aware of. Um, at Code42, you know, we saw it ourselves here um, I had a departing employee who was in our sales organization, and in particular was doing our comp and tell in our sales organization. And that employee had decided to leave. And in the last week of their employment, they downloaded some of our most sensitive customer information to their son's laptop. And um, I know you're probably thinking, wait, how do you guys have these exfiltrations at Code42 when you're in this business? I ask myself this all the time. That tells you how pervasive this problem is. Um, but interesting example, of course, when we interviewed that employee and talked to that employee, we found that that was not a uh, that was a malicious use of data, and obviously we took took actions from there. But really, really easy to do both of those things in the course of running your normal business today. So driver one, digitization and collaboration tools, both exploding. Okay, driver number two, listen. Knowledge workers can work from anywhere today. Yes, they're working from home. Yes, they're working remotely. Yes, they're working from Starbucks. Um, and 58% today work from home for all or at least part of their week. And it, it was interesting, uh, Dr. Dudson also talked about sort of the psychological factors that, that change how people work when they work from home. Um, so yeah, it's true that IT no longer controls the tools, networks, and applications um, when somebody's working from home, but it's really the psychology that's really interesting. When we um, uh, talk to workers, 37% say they use unauthorized apps every day on their company machine, and 26% use them weekly to share files with colleagues. So what are we talking about? This is uh, employees using their Dropbox accounts. Why do they do that? We ask them, why are you using Dropbox? Like, well, it's so easy. You know, I had trouble doing the same thing in G Drive or OneDrive, but I use Dropbox for my church or my soccer team or whatever. And it's so simple. So I shared some files with my team. But of course, once they go in that person's Dropbox account, they're there forever. Or Gmail. We see this all the time. People saying, yeah, yeah, I, I had trouble getting in the corporate email systems. So I'm just trying to do my job. So I'm sa sa you know, saving files via Gmail. Um, and, and Dr. Dutson's study, you know, he said that most security people the, the, the super heavy cyber security people were basically using basic tools. These are the tools they're using. They're using Dropbox, they're using Gmail, they're using Slack and public Slack channels. Very simple to exfiltrate data these, uh, this way. And their psychology is when they're out of the office, they're way more likely to use these kind of exfiltration vectors. What's the third vector uh, that's growing and increasing dramatically is that people are changing jobs faster than ever. Now, last year, 41% of employees plan to quit. That's an enormous amount of, of, of uh, number of employees. In 2022, the climate has really changed. We've gone from hiring frenzy to hiring freezes. And in many cases, we've gone to terminations. Many, many companies are laying off workers. 
Um, in fact, one of the things that we see when people switch jobs is, is a dramatic increase in exfiltration. So let me give you this example. It's kind of interesting for two on two dimensions. One is when, when um, Rivian was trying to hire some really good Tesla engineers that they needed to build their car, um, they did it, had an interesting way of doing that. And, and they went out and hired the recruiters that worked at Tesla. Now, in many organizations, and I apologize in advance, recruiters, I, I'm, it's just going to sound like I'm show, um, throwing some shade. I'm not trying to. But like in many organizations, recruiters would be considered at the bottom of the IP uh, totem pole. You know, they, they're they not the first person that comes up and say, who is who has all your company IP? You'd say, well, our recruiters do. But in fact, the recruiters do have a lot of IP. What they they know who, you know, what people are getting paid in their current jobs. And so Rivian hired some, some recruiters and those recruiters took data from Tesla on what everybody in key jobs was making, which makes it a lot easier to recruit them away. Okay, a lot of lawsuits about this. Um, I don't have any confidential information. My information on this case is uh, I've been reported in the press. So uh, really interesting uh, case there of what people do, um, you know, when they leave an organization and what they're likely to do. Now, if you're not convinced that people are changing jobs enough, listen, 59% of the workforce is Gen Y and Z today, and their average tenure is less than three years. And why is this so important? Because the number one risk indicator that somebody is malicious versus benign, I can tell you with definitive uh, conviction based on having 650 customers who uh, use us for insider risk uh, uh, problems is, is that they quit, is that people are leaving. Um, most of your people, your employees, your contractors, they will treat your information carefully. Um, and you know a lot of the risks they create by sharing documents publicly, accidentally, or using their Gmail, et cetera, are, are non-malicious. But the minute that they decide to go work somewhere else, then that non-malicious activity becomes malicious. And people admit it. They will tell you that they are taking data to use in their next job. And they feel it's their right to take it, whether it's their source code or their customer list or et cetera. And so that is the number one time when you need to worry about this. So we talked about sort of the three drivers of risk. What's the result of all this? Well, the, the result is a lot of lawsuits. And there's a lot of organizations that are not managing this problem by nipping it in the bud when it happens as people are leaving their organizations. And then what happens is a year later, you end up in, um, in a lawsuit, you end up in the press, et cetera. And these are all from you know, 2022. So this is a very real problem right now. And I mentioned, look, a lot of companies aren't dealing with this problem. In fact, um, nine out of 10 companies don't have any technology or any specific program to deal with insider risk. And you're like, how can that possibly be? Because um, you know we've had DLP technology around for 20 years, and how do companies not are not dealing with this? Well, the truth of the matter is, if you talk to just 10 C CISOs, all 10 will tell you that DLP doesn't work. It hasn't worked in the last 10 years. As soon as the world got off of being on-prem, as soon as data got started being shared all over the place, and we didn't have this concept of the of the uh, Coke secret recipe in the vault is our most important IP, um, DLP hasn't worked. And so many companies have just said, hey, we're just going to trust our employees and hope and hope things work out. And which reminds me of, of a story of one of our largest tech companies. Um, and the, and the, the tech company, when they first put Code 42's technology in, they, they've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of employees. And uh, when they turned this capability on to test it, they said, hey, don't worry. We have USB drives locked down. You won't see any exfiltration via USB because we have a policy that prohibits them being used and then uh, we disable them. And so when we turned the system on, we just saw an enormous amount of USB exfiltration, as you would expect. And then they came back and said, oh, well, we do have 30,000 people that have an exception from our policy uh, for using USBs. 
And uh, it turns out we now we realize that we have no visibility in what any of those employees are actually doing um, with their exception. And they, what we told them is, well, I'll tell you what they're doing. They're exfiltrating lots and lots and lots of data. And when you have 30,000 employees with exceptions, you know, you're going to have a lot of those leaving in the next, you know, 24 and 36 months. And so you can, you can guess, you know, sort of what they saw there. So as, as we look at this problem, though, I want to be clear, this is not a specific part of the organization where this is a problem. In fact, this is uh, uh, research that Microsoft just came out with about three weeks ago. And um, they talked to uh, organizations about where the biggest risk is. And you can see it's everyone. So it's not, this is not a, oh, you know, I want to protect the senior executives because they must be stealing all the data. It's IT, finance, ops, R&D, sales, management. We see it uh, across the entire organization. Um, what, we, what we don't see, though, it's not always malicious. The problems that we address are not always malicious. Um, even though it's in all departments. And a good example is um, we had a CFO recently who publicly shared a document that, that was entitled uh, restructuring plan. Now, I can promise you that that CFO did not mean to share that document. They were not trying to uh, create uh, some kind of uh, exfiltrated event. It was accidental. And so it's important to have a system that can not only see the stuff that is uh, malicious, but sometimes the accidental stuff can create a lot of risk as well. So clearly that, that needed to be mitigated. And I might talk to you about that a little bit more. My favorite example of when it's not malicious uh, was I was, uh, it was a visceral example because I was in the room uh, with Tim Briggs, who runs the insider risk program at CrowdStrike. And he was, um, we were working on some product ideas and sharing them with him. And he all of a sudden got a phone call. He picked it up and he said, hey, I need to take a second. He opened his laptop and he did uh, some stuff on his laptop. And about three minutes later, he closed his laptop and we all looked at him and he's like, okay, I know you're wondering what I just did, but here's what happened. I just got a call from my boss that a really senior level sales executive had quit. And what the boss wanted to know was, did that person take anything? And in three minutes, Tim was able to ascertain that, you know, across lots and lots and lots of vectors, that sales exec did nothing. And um, that's an example of a non-malicious threat that saved, you know, Tim said, hey, this would have normally taken us three or four days, but thanks to the technology that we've got now, you know, thanks to the Code 42 stuff, he was like, we can make that, we can ascertain in just minutes whether or not we have risk or not. And sometimes people forget that that's really a good side of all the, all the activity that's happening in this space is sometimes knowing nothing malicious happened is, is just a great savior of time. Um, and why is time important? And why is it important to find these, these kind of um, these risk issues? Well, these problems are expensive. I mean, um, you know, again, this is from the Microsoft study. 20% um, of insider risk data breaches cost over three quarters of a million dollars. That's one in five costs over three quarters of a million dollars. And 83% cost over $100,000. So if you have a breach with insider risk, you're gonna have, uh, you're gonna have a, um, an expensive problem. So I hope that helps convince you that you know, this is a problem, it's around, you know, it needs to be dealt with, it could be very expensive, and it's growing. That's the other thing. Remember, the three drivers are all things that are increasing, digitization and collaboration, people working remotely and people changing jobs. When you have the three vectors driving anything and all three of them are going up, you're gonna see a, a huge increase in risk. Um, but full stop, this is not your normal problem. Now, a lot of people on this call have been doing insider risk for a long time. And so some of this is gonna seem very obvious to them, but if you're a security professional and you've been in security a long time, but you haven't really focused on insider risk, some of this might uh, might make sense to you, and some of this might be uh, there might be some aha moments in here. Because as we think about the difference between security teams, cybersecurity teams dealing with external risk and insider risk, there are some very fundamental differences. So with external risk, we always have a bad actor, but that in insider risk, we have a colleague, we have someone who might sit down the hall, a friend. With external risk, it's fast moving, it's propagating. Your job in security is to stop that ransomware from happening as quickly as possible so it doesn't spread. 
an attacker doesn't move from one part of the network to another part of the network, et cetera. With insider risk, that's really not the problem. Um, in, insider risk, risk isn't contagious. It can be on a long-term basis, but in, in, in the short-term basis, it's not a contagious problem. And so it's more important to get it right to make sure you fully understand what the employee is doing or the contractor is doing before you hit them with a the sledgehammer. With external risk, because it's fast moving and propagating, the sledgehammer is the appropriate tool, right? So with we want to isolate, we want to quarantine, we want to interrogate, we want to do things very quickly. With insider risk, we want to investigate, we want to understand, we want to ask questions. Because a lot of times that colleague, that friend, that person in our office might actually be doing something to just try to get their job done. So we don't want to accuse them of malfeasance in that scenario. Um, a lot of times with external risk, you have a lot of endpoint focus, but with an insider risk, we really need to focus on the endpoint and the cloud because the way that people exfiltrate data has fundamentally changed. They don't just put things on a thumb drive, okay? My son is 23, he's a computer science major, he doesn't even know what a thumb drive is. I once asked him, do you have a thumb drive? He's like, I don't even know what that is. He's never used that because everything he does is on the web. Everything he does is in the cloud. And so young people today exfiltrate data through the cloud. They go cloud to cloud. They're not wasting their time necessarily bringing things to the endpoint. With external risk security, we got this. We know how to handle uh, uh, you know, uh, the bad guys coming in and we know how to squash their attacks. But with an insider risk, when we actually catch somebody, we're going to need HR and we might even need legal. So we need to learn, we got to exercise those muscles of working with other folks uh, at the same time. It's never accidental when we're dealing with an external attack. It's mostly accidental on the internal side. We don't need to educate hackers. There's no sense in doing that. That tends not to help our problem. But actually, education is critical for insiders because it shows them that we're paying attention. And it also teaches them what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. Most security people are not worried about legal issues when they squash an attack. But there are lots of privacy and legal issues here, especially as we roll out this technology around the world into certain countries which value privacy, say, more than the United States does. And um, we have answers and solutions for those countries, but you need to be really thoughtful for how you do it. And you can get fired as a security professional for not reacting fast enough to an external risk, but you have a much greater chance when it's internal for getting fired for overreacting. So we need a new approach. And Code 42 really has brought a new approach to this space. You know, they were uh, uh, both speakers were talking about how to identify the crown jewels and is that something we should be doing? And both concluded, no, we shouldn't. And there, we agree completely. We watch all users. We watch all data. We look for un we look for data moving to untrusted locations. So we want people to share data internal. We want collaboration. We want that to happen. But when people start sharing data outside the organization or to untrusted places, we want to know that. And we want to educate users in real time so they stop doing things so can we can keep the amount of noise out. Um, and we need to create consequences for people that actually do things. And, and most importantly, we don't want to get in the way of the company that's moving quickly. And we launched a product. It's called Code42 Insider today. And I added this slide in a few minutes ago because I realized that um, they're, they're not... Uh, we were talking enough specifics earlier, and some of you might be practitioners, and you might be like, well, what do you actually look? What are the things, um, the places uh, that exfiltration occurs? And so I threw this in there. I just screenshotted this right out of the live Code42 Insider product. You can see all the different places um, that that data is watched and the exfiltration vectors. And you know, all the ones that Dr. Dudson talked about is like, hey, I don't want to tell you what those are. I'm happy to tell you what those are because we really believe in, um, in, in this is the one space in security where you want your adversary and your adversary, your own employees to know that you're watching the store and you want them to know all the places that you're watching or at least a good chunk of them. So they'll think you're watching all of them. And the comprehensive nature is really important. Um, we also have lots of access to activity that's happening in your environment. Which users are putting data at risk? Is it sales? Is it engineering? Is it IT? What kind of documents are they moving? Um, are these critical events? Are they non-critical events? 
where the source is. Is this data coming from you know, our CRM system? Is it coming from our OneDrive system? Is it coming from our source code? You know, source code is the number one area of risk today uh, where people are taking uh, data. It's the number one growing area where source code is being moved by software developers to their own GitHub repositories. Uh, it's ex that, that is completely exploding. Anyway, so we built a product to address that. It's won a lot of awards. Um, it combines these elements of DLP, CASB, UEBA, and security uh, education and awareness. And I'm not going to spend too much time because we're because I'm going to I want to get us to the Q and A. But what I can tell you is that um, it's important that you bring all of these concepts in um, and that you address all of these. I want to skip ahead and just show you one video related to this part of the of the problem, which is the education part of the problem. So we all as security people are doing lots in education, but nobody's watching it, nobody's paying attention to it. But if you catch an end user in real time putting something in Dropbox, the best way to uh, to change that behavior is in that moment to actually provide them um, some education. Hi. Recently, you shared some files with someone outside of the company using Dropbox, and Dropbox isn't approved for storing and sharing our company data. When company data is saved to an unapproved cloud service, such as Dropbox, it goes beyond the protective reach of our security and IT teams, and it can more easily end up in the wrong hands, a risk that could damage our reputation, bottom line, and success of the company, of course, if you have a legitimate need to use Dropbox, please let us know. But to help protect data containing information critical to the security and success of our company, please only store and share them using our company sanctioned OneDrive. Now, obviously that video uh, is built for a company that uses OneDrive, but there's versions for G Drive and whatever. But the point of that video is that it teaches them what not to do. And it also tells them you're watching the store. And Unlike an external risk actor or a malware uh, uh, actor, we're 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 okay with them knowing that we're watching the store. We want that to happen. So there's lots of uh, customer quotes about how to solve this problem from some really great companies. There's actually lots of security companies um, that are using Code 42 today, and I think that's a that's a real um, example for many of you. If you want to, to understand, okay, well, what are the professionals using and they're using this today? And so I just wanted to walk you through all that. Again, give you a sense of why it's growing and then also give you a sense of, hey, there's some solutions out there that are pretty comprehensive that can help you solve this problem without getting in the way of, uh, of your users and their collaborating. And I hope you, you come see us at Code42 and uh, we're always open to chat with people about it and help provide the services people need um, working with folks like Booz Allen, who are our partners in this. So I appreciate everybody's time. And I think at this point, we're going to head over to uh, the Q&A session. Fantastic. Thank you, 